I bring greetings to you in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. On this early morning hours of this day, the last day of this month, 31st July, 2022, I am burdened by the Holy Spirit to make this recording. And today we are going to talk about two popular doctrines. Uh, one is uh, immortality on earth. The other is hyper grace and how the message of 2 Timothy responds to it. My recent reading of 2 Timothy, uh, I learned fresh truths and I want to share them with you. So shall we pray before we start this Bible meditation? Uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to dig deep into scripture. I pray that we'll be willing to unlearn and I pray that we'll be willing to learn from your holy word, especially the truths that you pen through the uh, pen of Apostle Paul uh, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Lord, 2,000 years ago, I pray that you will speak to us clearly, O oh Lord, as we live in times where we have, Lord, uh, a torrent of false teaching, I pray there will be a remnant who will listen to these words of mine, these words of mine, who will hold on to the truth of God's word. Lord, I pray that they will not, not only hold on to the truth of God's word, but they'll be willing to share over coffee table conversations, over restaurant dinners, over WhatsApp chats, and uh, Lord, through various ways, the truths that they have learned here, so that many people still in the grip of false teaching, Lord, will be delivered and they will hold on to the truth of God's word. They'll hold on to sound doctrine. We thank you. We ask all this with thanksgiving in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. All right. So I want to dive into this scripture. Uh, there is a prominent Chennai pastor, and I have heard him quote uh, this verse almost uh, triumphantly uh, to, teach, uh, to teach that the Bible teaches immortality on earth. By immortality on earth, I believe, uh, I mean, what he what he says is, if you believe in Jesus, you don't have to experience death, physical death, actual physical death. Believers in Jesus need not die. Uh, that's a teaching that they uh, he, uh, he teaches, and there are others who teach it. There's a pastor in Madurai who teaches that. In fact, we also know that there was a prominent preacher from South Africa who used to teach that, and, and he eventually passed away. But uh, this doctrine is still spreading like wildfire all across uh, India and the world, and it's uh, pretty popular. It's pretty popular that, and I call it immortality on earth. And one of the verses that uh, that is quoted to support immortality on earth comes from Second Timothy. So we're going to stay in Second Timothy and understand from Second Timothy why immortality on earth is wrong, why hypergrace is wrong. So we're going to talk about both these doctrines. But let's first look at Second Timothy chapter one and verse ten. I uh, read from the NIV Second Timothy chapter one and verse ten. Uh, it says, "But." It has now been revealed through the appearance of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So quoting 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, this preacher says, Jesus came to bring immortality to light through the gospel. So the gospel message include the immortality is included in the gospel message. Uh, well. Uh, you need to understand the truth of God's word, uh, the full truth of God's word. So if we just take that one sentence from that verse to say that Jesus came to bring immortality here and now and right now, uh, before the return of Jesus, uh, we can enjoy immortality on earth, it would be a wrong teaching uh, because it's pulling the verse out of context. And I've said this before, and I want to say it again. Uh, you see, when you say wood, uh, you ask, uh, is, it the, is it wood? Uh, I mean, right now I am, uh, there's a piece of wood and I have my, I have my laptop on that piece of wood, uh, a small table, or is it mark wood, the English fast bowler? So instinctive, Instinctively, instinctively, we ask, "What is the context when it when it comes to most matters?" Uh, but when it comes to scripture, uh, we are okay with pulling verses out of context and twisting it. Now, clearly, 
apostle what apostle paul is saying here in second timothy chapter 1 and verse 10 is when he says jesus came has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel it's very it's very simple you just have to read second timothy uh, the four chapters in one sitting and you'll understand this paul is in prison okay chapter 2 verse 9 second timothy 2 verse 9 as he writes these words he's in prison so chapter second timothy chapter 2 verse 9 for for which i'm suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal so he's in prison he's chained and he is awaiting death and he knows he himself knows that he's going to die that we see in second timothy chapter 2 and verse six, second Timothy chapter four, verse six, second Timothy chapter four, verse six, he says, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time of my departure is near. He uses the Old Testament word for death. Uh, uh, for further reading, we might want to check out Genesis 35, 14, Exodus 29, 40 to 41, Leviticus 23, 13, uh, Numbers 15, 5 to 10, the word drink offering uh, was uh, loosely substituted for death uh, in the Old Testament. So he he's, uses that very phrase from the Old Testament. I am being poured out like a drink offering, which means I am about to die. Some contemporary versions would even use that word. I am about to die. Now I'm going to die. Uh, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. And the time of my departure is near. So he himself knows uh, that he's going to die. He's in a prison and he's going to die. There was a time when uh, he was in house arrest. We, towards the end of the book of Acts, we had know that. At that time, he did, He knew that he's not going to die. But now he knows this. He's going to die and, and he's, he's going to be martyred for Jesus. So what he's saying is, I'm in a prison. I'm going to die. But it doesn't matter because eventually I know I'm going to rise up uh, uh, my uh, eventually, even though I die here and now, eventually I'm going to be with Jesus forever and forever. So that way I will be immortal. So that's the meaning. That's the full meaning. Now we see that Second uh, Timothy chapter four verse eighteen, the same book. He says he looks forward to his life in heaven. Second uh, Timothy chapter four verse eighteen. He says the Lord will rescue me from every attack and bring me and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. So Paul knows he is going to heaven. When he goes to heaven, he will be immortal. Immortality is not given here and now. And it this verse clearly says, verse 10 itself, uh, when the Paul talks about immortality, he's talking about the second coming. Immortality is tied to the second coming. It is not tied to your confession or your belief that I'm going to be immortal, I'm going to be immortal. It's not tied to that. Uh, I am immortal, I'm immortal, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to die. It's not tied to that confession that you make uh, in your church or what your church teaches. It's immortality is tied to the second coming of Jesus. It says in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, um, but it, now it has been revealed through the appearance of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought immortality to light uh, to the gospel. And then verse uh, 12 uh, clearly teaches that appearance is connected to the second coming. Uh, verse 12 says, that is why I'm, I'm suffering as I am, yet no cause for shame because I know him in whom I have believed and I'm convinced he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. So until that day when Jesus will appear again, that is when God, that is when immortality is will be our portion. He brought life and immortality. So what about life? So God has given us life. Jesus has given us life and we already have life. And that is the truth that is there uh, in the Bible. Uh, let's look at John chapter 4. Five, John chapter five, and uh, let's uh, look at this very important truth from John chapter five. John five and verse twenty four. It it says, "Verily, verily, I tell you, the words of Jesus: Whoever hears hears my word and believes me, who sent me, has eternal life and will not be judged, and has crossed over from death to life." 
So the moment we believe in Jesus, we already have crossed over from death to life. The moment we are born again, the moment we repent from our sin and put our faith in Jesus, uh, you know, we have crossed over from death to life. At the, at the, in the same way, the, but in a, in a way, we are still have not received life. And passages like 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, uh, chapter 2, uh, cha 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10 tells us that because it says that he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So Paul awaits life, uh, ultimate life in heaven. Paul awaits immortality. So when he crosses over from death, uh, he knows he's going to die. He's in a prison. He's going to die. And after, uh, and then he crosses over to heaven and there he experiences immortality. If there's a chance, and Paul does not know, even as he writes these words, uh, if Jesus would come back before his death, uh, uh, before his execution as a prisoner, uh, before his martyrdom, then even then he's going to experience life in heaven and he's going to be immortal. So immortality is tied to the second coming of Jesus. It's tied to that day. The immortality promised in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10 is tied to that day which comes which comes just two verses later in verse 12 2 Timothy 1 12 so when you read when you quote 2 Timothy chapter 2 uh, chapter 1 verse 10 to uh, to uh, and talk about immortality do not do it in isolation just scroll down and say that and look at that phrase until that day mortality will not happen until that day and what is that day the return of Jesus Christ. In fact, the return of Jesus Christ is again spoken of uh, uh, down the line in chapter four, uh, where it says, where he, where he, where he says, where he talks about that day again, verse eight, Second Timothy chapter four, verse eight. It says, he says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous Judge, will award me on that day. Not only to me, but also. All those who have longed for his appearing. 2 Timothy 4.8 connects the phrase that day to the second coming of Jesus. So if you long for his appearing, if you not, if you fall in love with Jesus today and stay in love with Jesus and you long for his appearing, one day when he appears, uh, you know, that is the day when he gives you life, ultimate life. We already have life. But in a sense, we don't have life. That life we have an immortality that we have. So that's the teaching. So don't twist 2 Timothy 1.10 to teach immortality on earth. Don't be fooled by pastors who teach that. or uh, So-called Bible teachers who teach that. Uh, because right in that book, we are warned in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, it says, for time for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So why does why do people preach immortality on earth? Because your ears want to itch to hear that truth. Because you don't want you you don't want to hear straight preaching like uh, if you die tonight where will you go you don't want to hear straight preaching like uh, you know if you died suddenly what kind of websites you would have left open what kind of shows would you be watching on streaming service device uh, uh, via streaming services we died just now. What's going to happen? So we don't hear want to hear that those kind of straight preaching. Preachers don't like to preach it. People don't like to hear it. So how do you change it? Twist, take some verses out of context. Root, just pick up verses here and there, and teach immortality on earth. It's not taught in the scriptures. It's it's a doctrine suited to soothe people's ears. So beware, beware. Second wrong teaching that, uh, and the and and a verse from Second Timothy is quoted. And I've heard a preacher, uh, hailing from Hyderabad, living in the USA, quote this verse to teach hypergrace. 
And I want to quote, I want to read that verse, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, if, we if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. If you are faithless, 2 Timothy 2, 13, if you are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. So, so what uh, the this preacher says is, even if we are faithless, as this word says, God remains faithful. So we can live in sin. So we don't have to be worried about sin in our life because if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot disown himself. But don't, again, just zero in on that one verse uh, and to teach that you can remain in sin and God looks the other way. Uh, God doesn't look at you and your sin, but God looks at Jesus and the cross. So you live as you like, and which is what the hyper grace gang preaches. That is not the thrust of that entire book. Read the, all the four chapters of 2 Timothy. You know, such a thought did not enter the mind of Apostle Paul. It, immortality on earth did not enter the mind of Apostle Paul because he himself was said in the same book that he was about to die or he was awaiting the second coming. Uh, to experience immortality and experience life to the uh, uh, life, uh, the ultimate life. Uh, uh, and the same thing I want to say here, Apostle Paul never envisioned that you will just read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If you are faithless, he remains faithful to teach that you can live as you like, because he does not say you can live as you like in 2 Timothy. Instead, he says in the same chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 verse 12 just one verse above if we endure he we will reign with him so he's calling for endurance not just accepting jesus not just raising your hand in one meeting sometime and living as you like but enduring remaining in him abiding in him if we endure he will we will also reign with him if we disown him he will also disown us If we are faithless, he will remain faithful. So in that context, what, what, what God is saying is, if you are faithless, I will be faithful to what I've said about your salvation. What has he said about our salvation? We must endure to be saved. What has Jesus said about our salvation? He who endures till the end will be saved. To his, God will be faithful to the words he himself said about salvation. That salvation is for those who endure those who abide, those who stay rooted to the wine. So if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Verse 13, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. It means God will be faithful to what he has already said about salvation. And God never said anywhere that you live as you like and uh, you don't have to worry about uh, sin. Rather, the thrust of the entire New Testament, and in fact, the entire Bible is that we must learn to overcome sin in our life through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the help of God himself, the, through the presence of God. And look at, and that is the thrust of the same chapter. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. It says, uh, it says there, uh, uh, nevertheless, God's solid foundations remains stands firm, 2 Timothy 2.19, uh, sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Everyone who names the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Hypergrace uh, theology says, you don't have to focus on turning away from sin. You don't have to preach. If you're watching porn, stop watching porn. You don't have to preach, uh, are you given to lust? You must repent from lust. You don't have to preach, are you given to that pet sin? Repent from that pet sin. You don't have to preach. But God's word says, if you name Jesus Christ, if you even take the name of Jesus, you must turn away from righteousness. So you have a choice to believe in what the hypergrace theology says and hypergrace pastors say or the written word of God. The written word of God says, if you name Jesus Christ, you must turn away from wickedness. Now, no, uh, well, the, the concern here is, so is this something that we have to do through our own 
effort. No, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. It's the phrase is used there. God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So who grants repentance? God grants repentance. If you have repented, it is the grace that God has given you. It is the empowerment God has given you. So even when we repent, we don't boast that we did it with our own strength. We always rely on God. So the Bible teaches salvation by grace and the Bible teaches daily holy living by grace. Both are by grace. Salvation by grace, daily holy living by grace. So we, if we endure, it's by grace because we, we cooperate with grace. We hold on to grace. So it's grace all through. That is the right grace. So let me clarify. So I'm not teaching salvation by works because even repentance, the Bible says it's possible when we rely on grace. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. Now, I want to read a few other scriptures before I close this short Bible study. Uh, let's read 2 Timothy 3 and verse 6. So what is one aspect of pursuing righteousness. So we are already righteous. Uh, the book of Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 says that, but we need to pursue righteousness. 2 Timothy 2.22 says we must pursue righteousness. Already righteous, but yet we must pursue righteousness till our death or till the return of Jesus. Every day be passionate for holiness. Now 2 Timothy 3.6 uh, talks about one practical aspect of holiness, which Paul was particularly addressing. So it is in this church there were some women who who were facing some real temptations. And one temptation was to meet with some certain false teachers behind locked doors. And when those meeting happen, when meetings happen behind locked doors, they gave in to the lust. So what I could, what I imagine is that behind locked doors, they had sexual relationships with these false teachers who had no qualms about sexually sinning uh, as well. But what does he say in 2 Timothy 3.6? These are kind, these are the kind who worm their way worm their way into houses and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. So there was some second Timothy 3:6. Read it again, read it 10 times, read it 20 times till you get the message. So there were false teachers who enter the homes of gullible women. And these women were already loaded down with sins, plural, and swayed by all kinds of evil desires. They're swayed by lusts. And when they meet these false teachers in a close setting, they give in to their sexual desires and there's a scandal happening there. So from 2 Timothy 3.6 comes a lesson through the negative example, comes a positive lesson. Uh, and we all know it. As the Billy Graham rule, never get into a locked room situation with a person who is not your spouse. And that's something which I've tried to follow the best way I know how. Never get into a locked room sitting with a, uh, with a person not my spouse. And I also try to do that virtually by making my phone available to my wife at all times. And uh, so at, the, at, no, at, at no time... Uh, somebody can, uh, from the opposite sex, can get into a chat with me thinking that I'm not going to divulge this to my spouse. So in that sense, I don't get into a locked room, even virtually. So that we are talking about daily holiness, which the Holy Spirit helps us to have, flesh out in our lives. So I want to finish this Bible study. So don't believe in immortality on earth. Don't believe in hyper grace uh, teaching where daily sanctification is made mockery of. So I want to finish with this uh, uh, story from the World Athletic Championship. There was a Nigerian athlete called Toby Amusen. And in the recently concluded World Athletic Championship in Oregon, USA, she created a world record in, a, in the semifinal. She ran that uh, 100 meters hurdles in a world record time of 12.12 seconds, 100 meters in 12.12 seconds. It was amazing because in the semi-final itself, she peaked 
and uh, and she got a world record. Of course, in the final, uh, there was a chance that she could have lost it, but she still ran fast in the final. In fact, faster in the final, her time of 12.06 in the final, which got her the gold, uh, did not was not a new world record because of the illegal tailwind, but she ran faster in the final. A world record in the semifinal and even a faster time in the in the final, but unfortunately it was not a world record because of the illegal tailwind. So Toby Amusen, this Nigerian runner, reminds us of what we must do in our spiritual life. Are we in the Lord now? That passion for God should be greater every passing second. The passion should not die down. And that is the thrust of the entire New Testament and the entire Bible. And flee from every doctrine that slows you down, that makes you, makes you sleep when it comes to daily holiness, slack when it comes to daily sanctification. Can we, shall we bow down our heads and pray? Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us to study your word. Uh, Lord, we saw two doctrines, two verses quoted, Lord, by people who embrace false teaching from 2 Timothy, Lord. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10 by the Immortality Gang. 2 Timothy 2, 13 by the Hypergrace Gang. But Lord, we understood when we read the overall message of 2 Timothy and the, when we saw the rest of the New Testament, we saw that they are, these are verses pulled out of context. These are verses twisted to teach uh, false teaching. Help us to get that. Help us to understand it ourselves and also teach it to, peop to people who are still trapped in these churches. And I, we pray for the repentance of all people, all pastors and lay people who are teaching these help populating false teachings. Lord, let them repent, Lord. Let them come back to the word of God. Lord, I pray that let sound doctrine thrive in the body of Christ. We thank you for this time, Lord. Help us to be passionate in our pursuit of holiness, empowered by the Spirit. Help us, Lord, to know that one day we could die and that, uh, that death can come anytime and we need to be ready to meet you whenever you call us. Even if it's uh, today, help us to be ready. Or it's, if it's going to be another 50 years from now, help us to be ready at that time. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus Christ, in my prayer. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. And over and above what you do for your church and other ministries that God has led you to support, if you want to partner with us uh, financially, please reach out to me via WhatsApp. 91 is uh, the country code. I live in India. 888 In other words, 888 uh, Send me a message via WhatsApp or you can email me, email Duke at gmail.com. Email is part of the ID. Email Duke, nine letters, E-M-A-I-L-D-U-K-E, -E, my first name. Email Duke, a total of nine letters, at gmail.com. You could email me or WhatsApp me and uh, I will give you further details. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, uh, privilege to uh, do this recording for you. And uh, uh, may God bless you as you embrace sound doctrine. Bye-bye.